Hi. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. Let me introduce you Matthew Hungerford. He's going to talk about Unified UI. Hi. Um, so I work for ChargePoint. We make electric chargers. Um, right now, we are just coming to Europe. So we uh, made a partner program with Daimler, took investments to come over to Europe. And uh, we're also working with Instavolt to actually put chargers on the ground for electric vehicles. That's... Um, so ChargePoint is primarily in the US right now. We have 70% uh, of all electric chargers in the US are networked through ChargePoint. Um, so I took this picture yesterday as I was preparing my slides at the last minute, of course. And so this shows the distribution of chargers in the United States. Um, up there in Montana, there's a couple people with EVs that don't have chargers by them. But throughout the rest of the US, we're uh, pretty dense for uh, charge point installations. Uh, so these are all grouped. So you can see that most of them show like 2,000 in San Francisco, uh, 1,000 over in New York. Um, so you can see pretty much they're the most heavily populated where people are or where there's a, a like Silicon Valley, where there's an extremely dense EV charging population. Um, the biggest strength of ChargePoint is our network. It's that we make it easy for drivers to find stations and uh, for stations to basically find drivers. So when a company like Target or Google or the mall puts a charge on the ground, they want people to be able to find those chargers and come to their store to charge there. Um, so here I have a picture from our company website. So over there you see one of our uh, popular charge point models, the CT4000. Those are um, typically a level two charger at like a em employment places, uh, offices, uh, at malls. Um, and then you see right now, the, this picture was also taken from yesterday. We have uh, 41,000 total charging spots in the US. So that's 41,000 places people can go to charge on the charge point network. Um, here we're showing off uh, the mobile app, this is how the normal charge point driver finds the station. So they take out their phone, they see this map, it shows them all the charges in the area. The green are available, blue are uh, busy or, or being currently used, and uh, gray ones for whatever reason are unavailable at the moment. Uh, so in the middle you can see uh, information about the charging station. So I can click on one of these, find a picture of it, open in Google Maps, go navigate to it. And over on the right you see your charging history. So that's the, the biggest benefit of being on a, on a network, having a cloud service, is that you're able to see information about where the charges are and also your previous charge history. So you can look from week to week, how much did I spend charging? Are there better times I could go and find a charging station by my work? Um, you can see utilization of a charging station. So maybe every day you get into work, you're like, the charging stations are always busy. You look at utilization, and right after lunch, there's no one uh, parked there because they've all charged in the morning or charged later in the afternoon. Um, so for ChargePoint, why choose Qt? Why use Qt for uh, station UIs? Um, our previous UI was terrible. It was a Adobe Flash Player UI used on the CT4000 we saw earlier. Um, it's no longer available for embedded systems, so we can't keep using this old station UI that we had. Um, the animations were extremely slow. Uh, we were on an ARM V5 processor uh, with an uh, old DirectFB, and uh, Flash Player was supposedly optimized for that, but any time we had any, uh, any animations, we were typically looking at 5 to 10 FPS. Um, one of the worst things was that video playback wasn't integrated. What this meant is we have a, a help video, and we also have advertisement videos that station providers can provide. Um, so typically, if you're having problems charging, you click on the help button, and it'll show you a video of how to swipe your card, how to plug in your car, and any error messages you might come up with. And, uh, Unfortunately, with this older UI, we had to pause the process of the UI, launch a full screen video, kill the video player, and then unpause the process for the, the Flash Player UI. And not only that, because the video playback was basically taken over the screen, we couldn't provide any UI elements while playing video. Um, one of the other problems we're trying to solve is that ChargePoint um, is not just our own charging stations. We actually partner with a lot of companies to put the ChargePoint networking card into their systems. Um, this is very akin to how Google handles Android, where they provide Android to Samsung, LG, HTC. Uh, any vendor can integrate Android on the platform. And then typically, Google will release a couple of products that they think are the best in class or the, the, the best experience, like the Pixel phones. So on the far right there, you see our, what we think is our best in class for the high-speed chargers. 
we enable other high-speed chargers to use our network to utilize our payment systems, our RFID, uh, our station UI, um, but in the end, we, we do provide our own hardware to kind of drive the experience. And then uh, here on the left, you see some home chargers. Uh, these two ones on the, on the left are fairly new. They're CPHM 400s. Uh, we just partnered to bring them to Europe. Uh, these are uh, three-phase chargers for EVs in Europe. Um, so here's a little bit about one of the problems I'm dealing with with this UI is that our old systems, and in the middle here is this newer one, the CPHM 400. Uh, we have a 640 4D display, five inch um, uh, screen with button interaction. Uh, and we also have a, a slower chipset and, and processor. So we're doing software rendering on DirectFB. And we have a custom video overlay plugin to be able to play video on there. On our newest high speed chargers, uh, we have a 1024768 10 inch display with a touch interaction. So on, on some systems we have buttons, some systems we have touch, some screens were low res, some screens were high res with a bigger display. And on this newer system we're using SceneGraph, OpenGL, and uh, EGLFS. So one of the reasons we chose Qt was so that we could do scaling between the different UIs, between the different feature sets. So here on the left you see the same UI with buttons and no touch, but, uh, no, no touch elements. Where on the right you see the, the larger size touch UI with buttons in there. Um, we actually provide a single binary asset of our UI to all the different platforms. So we basically write a feature once, we write an uh, interaction one time, and we deploy it everywhere. So we try to do our QA as intelligently as possible. We have a desktop simulation. We, tell, we want to simulate the low res with buttons, the high res with touch. We go through all the different translations. We go through all the different scenarios to make sure every string and every language fits. Uh, this reduces the QA effort to simulating and testing everything on a known desktop platform, and then knowing when they de deploy it, it'll look the same on those platforms. Um, an interesting choice we had was uh, how do you talk between the system services on the station and the UI? Uh, previously, this was done over like uh, sockets or FIFOs with our own uh, byte packed messages, and, uh, and there was all this ugly code to pack and unpack in both ends. Uh, we decided that the easiest thing, especially with Qt, was to use Dbus. Um, this is great because Dbus gives you both a transport layer, uh, a way of connecting different services, and also a message format so that you don't have to invent your own. And uh, because we're able to send any text or image or asset between the station services and the UI itself. Um, this also means that because we're simulated on a desktop, if we're using something like Ubuntu, it's already baked in. We don't have to have the person set up the simulator, have special software on there, just as Qt and Dbus. Um, one of the other nice things that Dbus uh, um, f follows a event-based model where you can send evented messages whenever you want. It also has a uh, property-based system where you essentially set up a property cache in a service, and then your UI only has to sync when those, those messages change. So you're able to reduce the bandwidth. You don't have to constantly pull or constantly send. Uh, the other nice thing is that for testing, we're able to use uh, Dbus send to send uh, through command line and bash scripts uh, events to the UI to control the UI to, to simulate to uh, audit. And uh, we're able to use Dbus monitor on the actual stations to see what's actually happening on the hood. So if I'm running a station and it doesn't do a transition, I can look, uh, sorry, I can look at uh, Dbus monitor and see exactly what messages, what format, why there's some error occurring. Uh, in the past, we've had numbers that were supposed to go from zero to one. Um, for a range, handle this percent, and they'd be going from zero to you know, 100. And so it wouldn't be showing up in the UI correctly because it was sending something it thought was an integer when it should be a float. And using Dbus Monitor, we're able to audit and find those issues. Um, one of the last things that Qt gave us that was great was uh, the concept of loaders in QML. Um, this was wonderful in that it allowed me to do layouts one time per uh, feature that we would have. So here on the left, we see a level three charging feature. So we show the, the state of charge, how many minutes until you're done, how much you have to pay. That's typically the consumer UI. In the middle, we show more of a lab UI. This is what, um, if you're an uh, automotive company making uh, electric cars, or if you're a bus depot, or if you're a, a repair shop, this is what you want to see is the, how much energy is going to that car, how, how many amps, what exactly is this car pulling, how fast is it, 
uh, charging. The normal consumer doesn't want to see current and volts. They just want to see how much is it costing and how soon until they're done. And then on the far right there, there's our level two UI. Um, level two vehicles don't provide state of charge. So all the things that we had on the left uh, uh, interface, we removed for the, the level two. But this is great for us in that um, as a person laying out a UI, I don't have to have a lot of if, uh, if and else's. I don't have to say, if I'm level two, load this component. Um, if I'm level three, make this one visible. I'm able to have each one have, be its own independent layout file and use QML loaders to load the one appropriate for the, the feature set. It also allows me to extend it going forward much more easily, where if I have a, a new layout, I can just create it from scratch, implement it, and then load it at runtime. Um, so to make this all work, especially for all the different uh, systems we had, we had to do quite a bit of work. Our older CT4K hardware has been around since uh, 2009 when we launched some of those products. Um, it uses an old ARM V5 chipset that has no OpenGL and an ancient version of GStreamer, so Qt doesn't like to compile against either of those. Um, our chipset came, from a, uh, came with a GCC42 toolchain that's not upgradable. And uh, so we actually had to patch QT5.6 to, um, to work around some of the C++11 requirements um, of, the, of some of the libraries in there. We optimized and hacked the DirectFB plugin for Qt to use our older version of DirectFB. Um, the original one wouldn't compile. We finally got it compiling. When it was finally rendering, we were getting four FPS. And a lot of that ended up um, things that were being auto-detected in the Qt plugin weren't actually being supported. And it sounds like in order for Flash Player to work, you have to report some features that you don't have as still being there, or the old Flash plugin wouldn't run. So they actually hacked the DirectFB plugin to say things like uh, full screen clear would be support when it wouldn't be, or uh, font blitting works when it doesn't, just so the Flash plugin would be available. Um, so we worked around those, and we were able to get uh, 25 FPS in the end on this ancient platform using Qt. Um, We also had to provide our own uh, video overlay element. Um, because we're not able to render to OpenGL, we need some other way of playing video. So we actually created a, a proprietary plugin to utilize a video overlay on top of the, the, the UI app. Um, but it's a lot more integrated than the old one. So we don't have to pause the UI. We're able to have uh, elements at the same time. We don't have the ability to scale the UI, so we just play a video at the format that the video is at. Um, because we don't have OpenGL, we don't have any way of rescaling or flipping or rotating. Um, but all the, our, our primary use case was satisfied. Um, because our stations are provided in many different countries in many different languages, we need user-selectable language translations. That's a feature that Qt didn't support. I don't know if it does yet, but a way of not just setting your, your desktop environment to be in German and then reloading the UI and having it be in German. We actually need the UI to switch to a language while it's running. So I can be on a charging page and say, well, I can't understand French. I'm going to switch it over to English and actually see what those, those messages mean to me. Um, the nice thing is that Qt supports uh, XLIFF, which is a standardized format. So we're actually able to utilize third-party uh, vendors to translate uh, strings for us. Um, so as we, we scale ChargePoint to other countries, we will, there'll be some languages that we just won't be able to speak internally. Um, so we'll have external parties translate for us. And then uh, we're using a, a JavaScript comma hack to actually force the QML uh, uh, layer to reload strings for the translations while we're running. Um, so earlier I mentioned that we provide one UI resource on all the different systems. The, the standard for Qt is to actually bake your resources into the binary for the station. And uh, so we actually hacked the, uh, the project file for, for QMake to separate out the uh, RCC file, the resource file, from the, uh, the native C file. So we're able to deploy a native C file for each platform compiled for their, their tool chain, their processor, and then provide the UI files totally independent. And that's one of the great things with QML is that it, it's not uh, pre-compiled. It, it's not uh, you know, native. It's actually interpreted. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this allows our QA team to validate all the translations, all the features, all the graphics at one time in one place on a simulation system. And once we've done that audit, we're able to deploy it to all of our stations that are out there. And as we have more and more partners coming online, they have small tweaks or requests where they might want to have a certain graphic on their screens or a, uh, a different layout for buttons for their, for their localization. And we're able to do that and then have QA audit without 
having that session in-house for each and every one of those units. Oh. Um, I just have a quick little demonstration here. So this is the So this is the charge point station UI over here. And so right now we're uh, using the touch experience at 1024.768. I'm going to go translate it into German. So now you can see that it's been localized. Um, I'm going to switch it over to being a, uh, a touchless smaller resolution. And so you can see that it tra did the translation on the fly, able to go see how much it costs, price is free. back in German. So I'm able to go through all these different states. So here I, I can use the uh, QML loader to switch between a, a level three, uh, the technical view for level three and a level two UI. And then, as I mentioned earlier, because I'm using uh, Dbus, I can actually run uh, bash scripts to automate testing. So here I'm just running a uh, previously recorded session where we, we monitored all the outputs using Dbus Monitor. I capture those, convert those into a bash script, and now I'm playing those back so I can essentially create recordings of any station that I want to replay back for QA or for my own uh, personal testing. So one of the, uh, the difficult things we had at ChargePoint was um, I'm the only uh, embedded software programmer that knows Qt there. So this uh, station experience on, the, on, the, on all, the, all the various stations we have is a quarter of my uh, engineering efforts. I also uh, work on the Linux stack, the drivers, and uh, some of the various components of the system. Um, one of the amazing things with Qt is it's possible for me to have this be a quarter of my time project. Um, any other UI framework, there's a lot more overhead, there's a lot more work for translations, for layouts, for auditing, for testing, for deployment. Um, because Qt is so efficient with everything, I'm able to have my job be much more easy. I'm able to you know, create these uh, recordings and do most of my work on a desktop without having to go into lab for each and every build. And uh, we still test our UIs on the stations, so it's not like we do a blind deployment, but we're able to do a lot more uh, pre-validation without having to constantly load each and every unit. Um, so I mentioned earlier that we're coming soon to, uh, to Europe. Um, we've partnered with Instavolt, who has started putting charge point chargers in the ground. These are the CPE-250s. So on the top, you see our charge point high-speed charging stations. Um, those two gray cubes in the back our, our power cubes, they're each 500 kilowatts. And uh, so this station on the top with the four dispensers is a megawatt charging station. So the, uh, the thing with the electric charging is you're really limited by how much your car can draw. So I have a cheap Spark EV. I'm only able to draw 30 amps. So I'm able to charge on one of these with my car in about 20 minutes for a full charge. If you were to have, oh, thank you. Um, if you were to have a, a Tesla, they can draw, I think, currently 50 amps. So you'd be able to get a full charge with your 300-mile battery in under, under the 20 minutes. And uh, we also, um, other than our, our super stations where you have the power cubes and the four dispensers, we also have individual charge stations. So if you were a uh, Starbucks or a, uh, a small coffee shop or restaurant, you don't have to have the full charging station. You'd be able to just put one in your parking lot. So as people come to visit, they're able to stop and charge. Uh, individual charging station typically provides... I think it's 62 kilowatts of power, um, which is still much more than most commercially available uh, electric chargers on the market. And then uh, downstairs, we have a de uh, demonstration station, uh, station set up. Um, I just have a UX demo box. Our high-speed charger is too large for me to, to ship conveniently. So we'll typically send it to uh, automotive shows. But for the, the Qt conference, we brought a uh, UX demo that we use for UX validation. Um, so whenever they want to take it to a country and see, does our user flow make sense, they take this small box, 
um, which is, per, uh, by, by the way, running a Ubuntu on a Surface tablet. And, uh, and then in the back there, you see the, the CPHM 400 on-ramp product. So this is used as our uh, networking kit for companies to add the ChargePoint services to their stations. So companies like Eaton, Preston, Schneider, uh, ABL, IES, Tritium have bought ChargePoint networking kits and added them to their hardware to bring their charges onto our, our network. And uh, this has been great for us in that we have a, a larger uh, deployment, a, a lot more stations on the network. Um, where they're able to hit price points that we're not able to hit. Like I said, we, we try to have best in class, which means a lot of times the stations are more pricey coming from ChargePoint. Um, but a, the, a lot of that comes with convenience of use, uh, easier installation, better footprint for the location. Um, so these are our, uh, some of our demonstrations that we have downstairs. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Um, presentation, thank you. Um, oh, thank you. How do you do the deployment or remote deployment when you have to update software? So uh, I mentioned earlier our ChargePoint networking uh, system. We call it our NAS, our network operating system. Um, since day one, back in 2009, we've built all of our charging stations with a, a OTA over the air updates. And uh, we essentially deploy the UI as part of the OTA. Um, for both the video file and the QML file, we have those as uh, remote deployment files that are just pushed for a set of systems at once. And that allows us to do um, regional um, differences, like deploy something different in, in Germany versus in the US, or deploy different schedules. Yep. Anyone else have any questions before we wrap up? Uh, how many uh, the different uh, connectors do those have? Um, so in the US, we really only have two connector types on the high-speed chargers, Chatamo and Combo. I know in, in Europe it's a little different. Um, those ABL units I was talking about earlier, they provide socketed, cabled type 1 and type 2 connector types. Um, and so the, uh, I, know, I know in Europe typically you provide your cable in your trunk, which I think is pretty unusual because every time you have to charge, you have to pop open your trunk, rummage around, find the cable and plug in. Uh, in the US, our stations are always cabled. We're trying to push the cabled model here in, the, in Europe. So for most of the stations that are two ports, one port is going to be cabled and one's going to be socketed. Yep. Any final questions before we're done? Good. Thank you.